Hello everyone, I'm here with Amanda CB running to represent Oregon's first congressional district and she is here to talk about her campaign. Amanda, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. This is amazing. I really appreciate it. I'm so excited to have you because unlike all the other candidates, you're unique in the sense that I can vote for you. You're in my district um, and I'm incredibly enthusiastic about your campaign um, and of course unequivocally I endorse you, um, where basically this is the only, I think, race where it makes sense for me to endorse. I already tacitly endorse pretty much everyone who I talk to, but I feel like in this district it matters because I can vote for you and anyone who I know will know who Amanda CB is. Um, so tell us why you decided to run for Congress. Of course, you're running against Suzanne Bonamici. She's not the worst Democrat, I would say, but I, I feel like she hasn't been adequately representing us. But I kind of want to know what made you decide to run? Well, she's definitely not the worst Democrat, but she's definitely not the best either. And that's part of the problem is that we settle for mediocre candidates so often because we don't have any other option. Um, what really got me to run, I really, I grew up wanting to run for office, but I never saw it as a possibility. You know, I was raised in a family where women weren't supposed to run for office. We were supposed to be the politician's wife. Um, so when Hillary Clinton ran, for the Senate in New York, it was like a big time for me. And I was so excited, but it turned into, well, she can run because she has the name and she has the money. But when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez ran and won, it opened up that entire possibility. I chose to run against Bonamici because she has been systematically bad when it comes to disability rights. Um, Disability rights are something that's very, very big for me. I am an injured worker. I became disabled after a f on the job fall. Um, my employers didn't give me the sufficient time off to recover and my modified duty turned into, okay, abandon your crutches and do your regular work. And it led to a full body nerve disorder and I lost everything. And so when we don't have anybody in Congress that really understands that and is willing to to represent that and fight back, then it's time for new people to run and who will fight for those things and who will represent those stories because there's so many more out there than we, we see and we understand. Every story in this country matters and everyone is important and we forget that. You know, I mean, one in five voters is disabled across the country, one in four here in Oregon. And yet the only time we talk about disability rights, it's in regards to disabled vets and the elderly. And while those are both very, very important, incredibly valuable members of our community, it's so much bigger and more diverse than that. And so it's time that those people have representation too. Absolutely. And I'm so glad that you are elevating this issue. What I've tended to realize is that like each candidate, they kind of bring something unique to the table. Like we all kind of check the boxes, so to speak, when it comes to progressive policy issues, Medicare for all, free college and whatnot. But each person kind of has that unique insight that I think is so crucial and important. You know, some will focus on housing for all. Albert Lee, who's running in our neighboring district, focuses a lot on housing, which is great. And you're focusing on disability rights. Incredibly crucial. Like my dad is in a wheelchair full time. He is unable yeah. to walk. And this is an issue I can tell you that does not get enough attention. And it's so important. And even though we've made a lot of progress, you know, the American with Disabilities Act was passed, it doesn't go far enough. And there needs to be more resources and wheelchair accessibility, um, that's one of many issues that needs to be talked about because we've, again, we've made progress, but not nearly enough. So we need someone with that perspective who knows firsthand um, what needs to be done. Now, I looked over your platform and your platform is incredibly robust. And just by looking at that really quickly, I can already tell you are someone who is eager to get in and represent the people. And I want to talk a little yes. bit about Suzanne Bonamici because she is someone who I kind of always just felt ambivalent towards she never really elicited a strong reaction to me because like we both you know uh concede she's not the worst but you know she doesn't do i think a good enough job at representing the people she rarely does town halls i showed up to the town hall that she did um a year ago and you know i i thanked her for co-sponsoring medicare for all but at the back of my mind i don't believe that she would actually fight for it in the event it came up for a vote um on top of that i asked her about 
a piece of legislation that was 3057. It's called the Fair Representation Act. And this is something that would end gerrymandering. It would move us to a proportional representation system. And on top of that, I think most importantly, it would institute nationwide ranked choice voting. And I asked her about this yes. and gave her the number, at, you know, the bill and whatnot. And I asked if she would co-sponsor it. And she said she'd look into it. It's been you know, more than a year, I haven't heard anything back. So I just feel like she's not responsive to her constituents. And it's just kind of, you know, I'll put in the bare minimum effort to make sure I pass and they're sufficiently satisfied. But I want someone who's going to go further than that, right? So let me ask you, because you're going to be my representative. Will you co-sponsor that piece of legislation? Now it's HR yes. 4000. Oh, see, and you don't have to look into it. You just know yes, exactly. No, I, mean, I, I know what that legislation is. I know about right choice voting. I know that we need to get rid of gerrymandering. I know that the people need to be picking their representatives, not the representatives picking the people. And we need to go back to the roots of what our government was founded on and the ideals, you know, we need to make sure that the people's voices is heard and gerrymandering does not do that. Yeah, absolutely. And see, this is what really, by you just answering so quickly, and candidates like you, like it shows you guys are coming to Congress with ideas that other people don't have. Like you shouldn't have to look into whether or not you support ranked choice voting or ending gerrymandering. It should just be like, of course, it's not even a question. And I think that's why it's so important that we have younger, a new generation just get out and run for Congress because you all have ideas that would benefit working class people, certainly in Oregon's first congressional district. So you have a huge platform and there's no way we can touch on everything, but can you go over a little bit about what you represent? Because I was so excited to see, you know, single payer Medicare for all, student loan debt cancellation. Um, imagine like the, the thought of you being my representative would be so exciting because I know that we would be adequately represented in this district for the first time in our lifetimes. So talk a little bit about your platform. I mean, for me, I am all about putting my money, my time, my effort where my mouth is. Everything I do and everything I say, I back up with action. I mean, I, I make sure that with the Green New Deal and everything that I am running my house on 100% green energy. And that even though I live on $735 a month, I have made that a priority to pay that extra little bit so that I can do that and have that. You know, I make sure that I am putting my name out there and fighting for immigration rights. You know, these things are really important to me. The woman I call a mom is a, she was an undocumented immigrant. She now has her green card. Um, but these people are parts of our community, and so it's really important to me. But for me, a social justice platform and government reform are the two biggest areas. We need to make sure that everybody is taken care of, that nobody is being left behind, and that includes our incarcerated population. You know, we need to make sure that the, we end the mass incarceration that has so many people systematically oppressed across this country, that we aren't breaking up families by sticking somebody in jail that shouldn't be there you know we have so many issues um let's see we have you know we mentioned the green new deal we mentioned medicare for all we mentioned uh education education is a big one we need to change the way our schools i mean i do a lot of tutoring and mentoring of our local kids here in my neighborhood and i have a 16 year old that can't read and he's still getting a's and b's and passing classes because they hired an aide to read everything for him rather than teaching him how to read. And we need to really put the focus back on what we're teaching our kids and how we're teaching them. And I mean, there are so many issues that we can solve if we just, if we stop making excuses, if we stop putting the priorities of companies and everything first, we need to stop putting the, pro the priority on profits. We need to take profits out of a lot of things because that's what's ruining things. I mean, if you look at the workers' compensation system, which is completely unbelievably broken, but nobody's ever talking about it. I mean, the same private insurance companies that messed up our healthcare insurance, they also messed up our workers' compensation system. So we have injured workers that should be getting full care treatment you know, back to work, and if they can't get back to work, they should be able to survive. But these workers are living on starvation wages. 
I mean, our elderly are living on starvation wages. We need to make Social Security supplemental social income and Social Security disability into a living wage because that alone would cut our homelessness rate by over half. Of our 554,000 homeless across this country, 40% of them are disabled and 30% of them are over 65. So just by making those three programs a living wage, we'd be able to cut those that number in over half. I mean, we need to start really implementing real change that will affect real lives. We can't make excuses and we can't brush off legislation that people bring up to us by saying, oh, I need to look into that and I need to get more informed. We should already be informed. We know the issues that people are facing. And if they don't understand those issues, then they shouldn't be in Congress. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this district, what's interesting is that, I mean, this is a heavy Democratic district, so there's no reason why, um, you know, we don't have a representative who isn't one of the loudest members of Congress pushing the envelope on all of these ideas. There's no reason why we don't have our own member of the squad in this district, because exactly. we're going to have a Democrat every single time. So there's nothing, there's no fear of losing to a Republican if you run too far to the left. There's, there, that's nonsensical. So it, it's really frustrating to know that we're getting someone who's just putting in the bare minimum effort, who doesn't right. really seem to be focused on a lot of these issues. But I am curious though, because Suzanne Bonamici, she's an incumbent who has been in there for quite some time, and she is heavily bankrolled by the industry. And you are someone who you're not going to have the backing of the state Democratic Party or the establishment. And this is a grassroots campaign. So my question to you is, how do you win successfully against someone who is a political behemoth like Suzanne Bonamici, who is going to be protected by those institutional and you know incumbency advantages? What do you think needs to be done? Because I know that knocking on doors and raising money is crucial. But do you think that in this district in particular, that's enough to win? And what is your kind of strategy individually to basically um, make sure we take this district for progressives? I mean, you forget that knocking on doors is incredibly hard for me because right. also 90% of houses have stairs leading up to them. So that's not something I can do. I mean, so that's another challenge that we don't even really realize. Yeah. So for me, it's going out where the people are. I ride public transportation. I don't have a car for a reason. So I de depend on public transportation. And I make sure that we turn like every max ride and every bus ride into mini town halls to get the word out, you know? I mean, the more time that I spend talking to people, the more we can get the platform out and the more that we can get name recognition and get the word out, the more people start to talk and the more people start to, to listen. I mean, the biggest obstacle I'm going to have is name recognition. And once people learn who I am, like you said, a majority of our our district is very progressive and they want progressive representation. But it's just that name recognition. And that's where I come into so many problems is because to get that stuff, you need money. And I refuse to take the money from the big businesses. I refuse to take lobbyist money. I refuse to take super PAC money from corporations. And I'm not going to do it. I refuse to sell my soul to a company to earn this pot. I know I can do it other ways. So, I mean... I'm, I'm going to do everything I can. I'm used to, I mean, I live on $735 a month. I know how to stretch a dime. Trust me. I mean, I'm going to do everything I can to get that name recognition out because that's the only way we're going to win. And that's why I need the help because it's so much more challenging when you're in a wheelchair trying to get around. And people are less likely to talk to you when you're out and about without a wheelchair or with a wheelchair. Yeah, that's Which is just a sad reality. Yeah, that's that's really sad. Um, and, you know, when I think about a robust democracy, I think that anyone ideally should be able to run for Congress. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you have that limitation, it really kind of puts it into perspective that we're not as equal as we thought we were. I mean, certainly we all have different privileges and whatnot. You know, we have subjective experiences, but it really crystallizes it. And, you know, it's, it's frustrating because if somebody has the right ideas, then they shouldn't be limited for reasons that they're not able to control, immutable characteristics. So the fact that you have a wheelchair shouldn't be a barrier, you know, and theoretically you could overcome that challenge 
but you'd have to sell out and take a lot of money, you know what I mean, to get the name out there. And that's why publicly funded elections are so important, you know, because the only thing that should really separate our candidates is their policies. You know, I mean, it shouldn't be who raises the most money. I mean, Bonamici right now has a million dollars in our campaign fund. And we, we definitely don't have that. <laughs> definitely don't. I mean, yeah. the disabled community is one of the poorest communities in the country. And, you know, bankrolling a candidate is not an option. And so we need as much help as we can get. I mean... We need representatives who are willing to step up and, and represent average people. I mean, Bonamici's worth six million dollars. I don't know the last time she's been able to make an ends meet on seven hundred and thirty six, which is the minimum social security disability payment. That's really astounding. I don't think I've ever met anyone who's worth six million dollars, except for her actually, when she came to the town hall. Yeah, it's <laughs> easy to see why she's become so out of touch and complacent because when you have that much money and you're comfortable and you're not really engaging with your constituents as frequently as you should be of course you're going to grow out of touch you're in that dc bubble now you know you're part of the establishment who you're you're occupying the seat but are you fighting no and i think you made such a phenomenal point about name recognition because the way that i feel is in all of these elections like all of these candidates who i talk to yourself included without question if enough people knew who you were you'd win nine times out of 10. But the real struggle here is making sure that people in that district know who you are. And I know in the first district of Oregon, if people knew about you, they would absolutely vote for you because this is a very progressive district. Like I am so surprised people who stereotypically don't seem Democrats uh, or, or, or liberal or left leaning in this district, they are actually, you know, they're concerned with the rights that you you've raised. And that's really encouraging. And what it tells to me is that Look, we can do so much better. Like, I, I appreciate Suzanne Bonamici's service. She played her part for, you know, a, a number of years. But it's time we get someone in there who genuinely cares about all of these issues. And it's clear to me that she, she doesn't care about these issues. Um, now, I want to talk about your endorsement. You've been endorsed by um, the Oregon chapter of Justice Democrats, which I think is yes. incredibly exciting. Um, has there been any interest for your campaign? And can you also talk a little bit about the dynamics of this primary race? Because I believe there's only one other primary challenger besides you in this race. But it seems like you're the go-to Progressive was actually running on a bold platform. So talk through the dynamics of this race and if there's any local organizations, DSA chapters, who have taken an interest in your campaign. Yeah, I mean, I'm working on my Oregon Progressive Party uh, endorsement. I've been working on um, getting a couple other local endorsements. The DSA is one that I'm, I'm hoping on. I am a card-carrying member of the DSA and have been since 2016. So I'm hoping to get their endorsement, hoping to earn their endorsement, hoping to earn the AFL-CIO and the SEIU because um, unions are so important. I mean, I know if I would have had the backing of a union when I was injured that there's no way I would be in this wheelchair right now, you know? And we need to realize that and we need to recognize that. Um, so the union support is incredibly important to me, which is why I've been out and I was out on the front lines marching with the Burgerville Workers Union when they were out striking for a fair wage and fair rights. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm trying to get out to as many as many groups as I can to get my name out because I really believe that there is more that unites us than divides us. I mean, we let little things like policy, one little policy divide us when there are so many bigger issues, like everybody needs health insurance. You know, the things that we cannot avoid in life are death, taxes, and disability. It doesn't care. And these are things that affect everyone of every social economic standing and every class, every race, every religion. And we need to realize that if we just come together and find the solutions that our country and our world can be so much better we need to stop coming up with all the reasons we can't and start looking for the ways that unite us and the reasons why we can. A hundred percent agree with that. Um, yeah, I think that these endorsements that you're seeking are so crucial in, in terms of like getting your name out there. 
Um, because that really is the struggle that I see with all candidates. You know, they talk about a lack of news coverage because, of course, you know, it, it's difficult enough to see mainstream media cover top tier candidates like Bernie Sanders. You know, they don't want to cover the people who pose an interest to them financially. Um, and your story is so like if people knew about your story, I think it would resonate because the really the sad aspect and why I think your story in particular is so important is because your injury was totally preventable. Had we had laws in place to protect workers like you, it would have been preventable. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I find it so just angering that you're in this situation because workers are not respected in this country and we don't have rights. I mean, I sprained my ankle. I mean, that, that sounds so unbelievably ridiculous. I sprained my ankle at work. Um, I, it should have been six weeks of recovery six weeks of just you know modified duty but because they were like oh no we really need you to do this and oh no if you if you take that time off you'll get fat and then you'll be useless to us things like that i mean the pressures that workers face i mean i lost my housing and had to move my husband and i in out of california up into my parents house because we lost our housing because I was the sole provider for our family. You know, I mean, we have to realize that what workers face when they become disabled is unbelievably undignified and humiliating. Nobody wants to live off of food boxes. Nobody wants to live off of meals on wheels and have other people decide what you're what food you're going to eat when. Um, I hate having to go in for energy assistance. It is the most humiliating thing. Um, I have had to pick up skills I never thought I would. I make a majority of my own bread now because I can't afford bread. Um, so things like that. I mean, those are the struggles that every family faces at some point in time or other. I mean, we're all a lost job, an injury, a sickness, away from debt, bankruptcy, homelessness, and those are the real issues that need to be covered. And I mean, while Bonamici says that she supports things like Medicare for All, like you said, she has $300,000 invested in our current healthcare system. I mean, when it comes down to it, is she going to be willing to take that big personal hit? to make sure that the rest of us have care when she's not already, you know, really fighting for it. And, you know, I mean, we need representatives that are willing to stand up and lead by example and can really address these issues. And that's why I support people like Bernie Sanders, you know, and that's why I'm running. Yeah. Your experience, I think, is so important. And these types of experiences of candidates like yourself who are running it sets you apart so much from people in D.C. because people in D.C. oftentimes, you know, they come from Ivy League schools. They're very wealthy and they they've never had to struggle like the situation, like the story that you share it resonates with me so much because my dad, he had his own business and was basically like starting the American dream. And then he got injured and then lost everything. And then we were living off of food banks, you know, um, and. You know, in, in Portland, when we were living in Portland at the time, thankfully, there was a lot of options for like, you know, food banks and clothing banks, which I had to go to, you know, for uh, clothes for myself and whatnot growing up. But um, it shouldn't be a situation where, you know, something happens to you that's completely out of your c control and you lose everything you worked so hard to build. Like, why why are we paying taxes if we're getting nothing in return, if we could lose everything, you know? <laughs> I was working as a restaurant manager when I was injured. I was saving up to do my paramedic program so I could go back to being a, I was a volunteer firefighter and an EMT. And that's what I really wanted to do. And so while saving up for that program, I got injured and lost my entire future in a lot of ways. I lost my family. I lost, you know, uh, divorce is incredibly common when you're disabled. Um, there's so many other issues that never get addressed or talked about. And I mean, these are issues that so many people face and we've completely ignored them as a society. I mean, if you look at 
movies and television. All the disabled roles and everything are played by able-bodied actors. We don't ever see disability. And part of the reason we don't see disability is because nothing around town is accessible. I took candidates down there this last week and put them all in wheelchairs. We took, uh, let's see, Albert Lee, Jason Call, um, and a couple other Portland candidates around make it halfway before they had to give up and come back. They just, they had no idea. And a lot of people just don't until they have to face it. And the fact that we don't have anybody in Congress right now that really has to face it, the fact that most people that depend on our health and care and our health insurance system are patients, and yet there's no real patients in Congress to represent that voice as we go through this national health care debate is insane to me. Mm -hmm. You know, we can do so much better. Imagine how much better our health care system would be if patients actually had a voice. I mean, yeah, everything you're saying, it, it's just, I totally agree. The, the worst part is that all of these horrible things are happening when they don't have to be. Like, we are the richest country on the planet, and these things don't have to happen. Um, and, I, like, I'm tired of, like, if you if you shared your story with Suzanne Bonham Michi, I'm sure that she would, you know, say, oh, thank you so much, you're so, so brave, and pat you on the shoulder. But would she actually fight? And the answer is no. We need people who are actually going to fight. So, I mean, you've already convinced me. You've won my endorsement, of course. Um, so tell people what they can do to support you and um, even if they don't live in this district, what they can do to basically spread the word about your campaign and help you, because I am all on board and we want you to win. Thank you so much for that. That means a ton to me. Um, any help we get is appreciated. If you live in district, we need help getting the word out. We need help getting to doors and door knocking because I can't that can go out and knock on doors that are willing to help step up in that way. Um, finances, like I said, I live on nothing. We have a very poor community. So anybody that is willing to donate, even $5 goes a long way. If we can get 10,000 people to donate $5 and we have $50,000, I can make magic out of them, you know? And the big thing is recurring donations. People that can give $5 a month that makes a huge difference for candidates like me. Um, being able to count on that monthly donation is amazingly huge. Uh, we can do a lot with that. So any way you want to get involved, there's ways for you to help. A lot of online warriors are always welcome. Anything we can do to get the name out. So there's a place for everybody and everybody's help is appreciated. Yeah, and really getting the name out is super important because I didn't learn about you until I, you know, um, I looked for you. I believe I found you on Ballotpedia because I was curious, like, is there anyone in my district who's challenging Suzanne Bonamici, who is awesome, who's like progressive? And I found you. And I think that if people knew about you, that would really like we, we talked about the name recognition. It would go a long way because people just... They want to be represented. They just need to know that they have other options. So really sharing those recurring donations and really volunteering since Amanda can't knock on doors. Again, that would be incredibly important because getting the name out, getting her name out and having conversations with people, it's less scary than you think it is. And I know a lot of people who talk to me and they say, you know, phone banking and doing canvassing, it was really intimidating at first. But once they started to do it, it became second nature because what you end up finding out is that you have a lot more in common with people than you initially think. And even though politics is incredibly polarizing and divisive, it's not as bad, especially in these types of districts where we are incredibly, incredibly left leaning and blue. Um, of course, that's not to say that we don't have our own Republicans here, um, but you're going to find people who agree with you more often than not. And if they know that Amanda Seabee is challenging Suzanne Bonamici and you tell her about these, tell people about these policies, we win. It's as simple as that. So uh, before we go, tell us uh, the website. It's www.cb2020.com, S-I-E-B-E-2020.com. 
Well, Amanda, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I am incredibly excited to vote for you. I will be setting up recurring donations since you are in my district, um, just for full disclosure. But I mean, I think it's obvious that I support the people who I bring on. So <laughs> either way, thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you. I appreciate it.